Welcome to Founderline, the show where we answer your questions about startups. I'm your host, Joe Beninato. Thanks for joining us today. It's great to have you all with us. Our goal with Founderline is to provide a forum where startup founders and employees can get their questions about startups answered by experienced entrepreneurs and investors. Uh, maybe you're thinking about starting a company. Maybe you've already started a company and you have some questions about a situation. You might be an employee who's thinking of joining a startup. Whatever it might be, if you have a question, uh, we'd like to try and help you out. So please, uh, please get in touch with us and we'll see if we can do so. Um, this is a live show and in order for it to work, we need to get questions from you, the audience. So um, if you wanna contact us, you can call us now, toll free. It's one 844 founder is the phone number. And you can email help at founderline.com. And you can also tweet to at founderline and we'll see if we can uh, help you out. With that, let's get started. Our guest today is David Hornick, who's a partner at August Capital. David's worked with some great companies, including Splunk, StumbleUpon, and Aardvark, as well as many others. David, welcome, and thank you for joining us today. Yeah, thanks. Happy to be here. Great to, great to have you here. Um, before we dive into the questions from the audience, um, I usually spend a few minutes just a little chit-chat, you know, to get oh, to man. know you. And you know, uh, you know I'm bad at that. Yeah, I, I, know, I know you are. I know you're a wallflower. <laughs> Um, but uh, it's a good way for the audience to get to know you a little bit since, you know, nobody's ever heard of you before. Fair and, uh, point. Yeah. So, Hornick. Hornick, who's that? So um, uh, the first thing I thought was interesting, and you and I have known each other since back when you were a, a lawyer. Um, so you, you started out as a lawyer and then made the switch into venture capital. Yeah. and. Maybe talk a little bit about how how did that come about? Like you're working away at was Perkins Coie at that point in time? Yeah, and... for sure. No, I mean, uh, I just got a little bit lucky, and I was kind of a loudmouth, and that was that was it. I mean, you know, I got to I I had uh, I I was an undergrad at Stanford, so I had yep. been out in Silicon Valley, got to know a bunch of really smart people, and then I went back east and went to law school. I became an attorney and. Um, and in 1997, it became clear to me there was all sorts of amazing stuff going on in, in Silicon Valley, and yep. I came back. And, uh, and at that point, was at a firm called Venture Law Group, and my very first client was you, as a matter of fact. My very first- We, uh, we couldn't tell. We couldn't tell at all. <laughs> Those were the days. That was when.com, of course. When.com, uh, yeah. It was the first company I incorporated. Now, it turns out that incorporating a company, not so hard. And the reason it's not so hard is because the paralegals do all the work. Yes. <laughs> the lawyers don't actually know anything about incorporating companies, but that's whatever. And I, I just heard from Jim Brock uh, the other day, so oh, awesome. I haven't, haven't seen him in a long time but uh yeah those were those were some good they times. were pretty amazing times and so jim brock's the guy i worked for uh who was very generous put up with the fact that i came in having been a litigator and suddenly i'm representing startups but um you know i started working with startups in 97 it was incredibly busy and uh and and the the pace was sort of stunning right so you know when.com is such a good example because here we were in in I guess probably 98 it yep. was got started and incorporated. Yep. You raised a Series A round, which I was the lawyer helping on. Then you raised a Series B round, which I was the lawyer helping on. Then you started M&A conversations, which I was the lawyer helping on. And we closed, I, my recollection is I closed the M&A deal the day before the first anniversary of the company, or was it the it was, it was three days before, it was like 350 something days. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it was crazy. It was, cra it was crazy, right? Yeah. But the good news, and, and the good news is, it was a great outcome for you guys, it was a great outcome for your investors, great outcome for your company, and I, learned how to incorporate a company, did two series of nuts, financings, huh? yeah. and, and then I got to do a bunch of M&A work, and, and it was a great, and I was doing all your licensing work too because it was Which, like, oh, you had a ton of stuff that needed to get yeah, done. We did right? like 20 deals in oh my like God. three to six months. Right? Yeah, and yeah. I was, you know, it was, uh, you and I were joking earlier about how little sleep I get, but the reality is that's when it started. You're, 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 you're <laughs> the you. It's my problem. fault? No, no, it's totally. James's fault. It was James, James Watkins' yeah, fault. Yes, absolutely. He's like, David, get that done, you know, but that was the time, right, when it was like, oh, well, there's a license that needs to get done. I'll stay up all night, get it to James in time for him to go negotiate the next thing, right? Yeah. Um, but it was this path where not only were you learning a ton and working with a bunch of interesting companies, but you were just, the pace 
was all, you know, it was like in hyperdrive. Yep. And so by between 97 and 2000, I was working with a bunch of really interesting founders and a bunch of really interesting companies. And I got to know a number of venture investors. And one of those was uh, August Capital, who were investors in, in Evite, where oh. I was also an, uh, an attorney. Yep. And I, I was representing Evite. I was at all these board meetings. And as you witnessed, right, my job was not to say, hey, you know, you should talk to so-and-so because I think there might be a good opportunity. But I did anyway because I just thought, oh, this is a good idea. I'll tell you. Uh, and so the August guys got to know me at, at the Evite board and were sort of like, have you ever thought about the venture business? Hmm. And um, and I thought, wow, that's great. You know, absolutely. And so they then interviewed me for a bunch of time and talked to everybody I knew and eventually offered to have me join the firm. And it was only, you know, Months later that I sort of realized, oh, my God, I don't have any idea how to be a venture capitalist, right? I mean, I knew how to be a loudmouth and I knew how to be an attorney, but this VC thing, that's a whole new, whole other can of worms. But. Well, you're not alone from uh, in my experience. <laughs> so uh, just kidding, VC friends yes, out there. Yes, he didn't um, mean it at all. Um, well, so so that was 2000. And, and obviously, we're uh, approximately 14 years later. Yeah, exactly. By my math. Exactly. Uh, so, so like, what's... What's changed in that time period? I mean, in those days, uh, there there was no angel list, right? There there were yeah. none of these like party rounds with eighteen angels putting in fifty k each or whatever it is. Uh, different beast, obviously. But what, what's, what's well, changed everything's in your mind? everything changed, right? I mean, and 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 not only did it change, but it's changed multiple times, right? So I joined August in June of two thousand. Okay. The market then went and crashed. And everybody, and literally, venture investors were hiding under their desks. And by hiding under their desks, I mean they were playing golf. They were like, <laughs> you know, wow, the economics are terrible, and I'm not excited about this. So, I'll just go do other things until I'll it network. feels better, network. right? Yeah, like oh, we'll go do it. There was a very famous VC who was who was sort of called out by his LPs because he was tracking all of the golfing he was doing online. And they were like, we see, you know, like you're supposed to be investing and you're tracking your golf. That was pre-Facebook you know? even. Yeah, so, oh uh, man, yeah, you would have been yeah, to totally would, doomed. Yeah, that, was, that was bad. I'm easy to track on Facebook now, yeah, right? Yeah. It's like, oh, there's Hornick now. Um, but I had just gotten into the business, so I, I thought, okay, well, if the if it's challenge the consumer internet is challenging, then we'll look at other things. And so the very first company I funded was a uh, an online payroll company called PayCycle, which it just struck me. Oh, of course, payroll would be it, to serve small businesses would be much better if it was an online experience. And so that was an interesting business. Intuit ended up buying that company. It was a gr great outcome for the company and the founder, a guy named Rene Lassert, yeah. who I have now funded again in a company called Bill.com, where That's he's right. he's moved on from payroll to accounts payable and accounts receivable. He really likes pain. He's a fan. He? He's a fan of the you know financial processes. Um, but anyway, so so no, people hated consumer. They thought the consumer world was dead. Uh, they, every, you know, to the degree that VCs were investing, they were investing with each other. It was like, all right, I'll do it if you do it. Yeah, you know, so yeah. okay, we we'll both invest. And yeah. That's gone away. You know, so there's been this very and so. It wasn't until 2004, 2005, when people started thinking, oh, maybe consumer is kind of interesting. Then by 2008, the market crashed again and went to, went to hell in a handbasket. Then it was like, oh, well, the consumer stuff is interesting, but it's all gotten done. Yep. But wait a second, there are a bunch of these enterprise businesses that look interesting. This company Splunk, which I funded, was like, Hey, that came out of nowhere. Nowhere. I had been on the board for seven years Overnight by the success. time it came out of nowhere. Yes. You know? um, so it's just shifted a lot. There, there are bigger firms now. There are what are called full service firms that are helping you with marketing and recruiting. There are these angel investors who've turned into venture capitalists and now you have these micro VCs. I mean, it's an incredibly fluid thing, but at the end of the day, we're all doing the same thing, which is there are entrepreneurs who have great ideas. They're trying to trying to build teams of people to solve real problems. And then there are investors who are trying to give them the resources they need to go create real value. Yep. And what that structure looks like is sort of irrelevant because if you're successful, if, if you give money to entrepreneurs who make real change, who create real value, everybody makes a lot of money in the process and you change the world. And that's what's incredibly exciting about about being an entrepreneur and about being an investor. And that doesn't change. It just gets harder and easier depending on the minute, you know? Cool. That's, uh, that's awesome. So, and you, 
you mentioned you've done investments in a, in a pretty wide variety of <laughs> yeah. industries. So what what gets you excited right now? Like what sorts of things, if, if, if this sort of company came along or something in this space, like uh, what, what, yeah. what areas are you looking at right now? Yeah, I, I mean, because I came into the venture business completely unqualified to be a venture capitalist, then I was unlimited, <laughs> right? I mean, because there were lots of people came the in, oh, your <laughs> right, they're like, oh, great, you're a networking guy, I'm gonna put you, you should do networking deals, yeah, right? Or, yeah. oh, you, you were involved in blah, blah, blah. But I, you know, I didn't have any of that, so it was, I could do payroll, and then I did an enterprise software company, and then I did a cons pure consumer business. Uh, I've done a bunch of payments-related businesses. So um, what I would say is, I like to invest in software and software-related software -related businesses because I get them. I can under I understand how you can write a piece of software that will allow computers to to do payroll or to um, create price optimization or whatever, right? Yeah. Um, Beyond that, I really don't have a point of view. My view, my sense is that entrepreneurs are smarter than VCs, right? That's any VC who thinks that the entrepreneurs are not smarter than they are should go start a company, yeah, yeah, and then be wrong. You know, like those, <laughs> those are, those are, so I, I don't think I'm smarter than entrepreneurs. I want to fund the smartest, most interesting, most thoughtful entrepreneurs who come up with something that you wouldn't think of, right? Danny Shader, who started this company, Pay Near Me, yeah, you know. No one was thinking about this question that a quarter of the U.S. population is unbanked. They have no credit cards. So how do you participate in the online world if all you have is cash? Well, you know what? Danny solved that problem in conjunction with folks like the 7-Eleven stores and others to allow you to go and pay $48 in cash and buy a ticket that you bought from Greyhound online. Yeah. Right? That sort of thing. Would we think of that? Like, yeah. oh, you know what? I totally want to solve this problem. Well, I have to tell you, when Danny was going to start that, we, we happened to be getting together. And he told me he was looking at like pawn shops and other things. I'm like, what are you doing? And, uh, and it, turned, it turned into Pay Near Me. So, uh, yeah, and if you look at it now, right? So go from pawn shops to relationships with major government entities to do things like pay your parking tickets, yep. pay alimony, pay, you know, things Whatever that might be. pay your rent, pay for your cars, right? Re be engaged. How? How can we have a quarter of the population that's excluded from the digital economy? That's insane. Well, nope, so problem solved. Next, what else have you got? No, that's cool. And, and I hear they're doing really well. By the way, uh, public service announcement, tomorrow is free Slurpee Day at 7-Eleven. Free so, Slurpee Day. Yeah, it's 7-Eleven. So. so when you're paying with Pay Near Me for your rent or whatever, get your free Slurpee. Get your free Slurpee. All nice. right, well... Um, uh, why don't we see if we can help some people out instead of just talking about free Slurpees? That so, is helping people. Uh, oh, you're, you're right. If that's we a, are going to be excellent we're, point. I'm telling you, if we are helping people more than a free Slurpee, we have nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we uh, we have our first caller, and uh, let's see if uh, let's see if we can get this to work. Um, let's see. It's it's thinking. It's thinking. There it is. So uh, we we have Hong on the line. Uh, Hong, how are you? I'm not hearing Hong. Is he there? I'm not hearing him. Oh, I was looking forward to that question. Oh, and I'm sure I'm sure it was a good one. Hong, if you can hear us, um, we'll try and uh, we'll try and get the audio issues worked out and uh, call back in a second. You still there? All right, we'll keep. Uh, oh, it looks like he dropped off. Maybe he had to go somewhere. Cell phone. So close. Um, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we're gonna we're gonna move on, and uh, may, maybe he'll call back. Um, I'm hoping my mother will call in. Betsy yeah, Hornick. Well, what's well, the number again? Eight four 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 founder. Eight four 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 founder. You should have texted her beforehand. Yeah. Oh, she's Is Pamela listening. watching right now? Not Tell a Pamela? chance. Oh, okay, there's right. not a chance. All right. Um, <laughs> okay, we have a tweet. Uh, this came in the other day from Agent Red. I don't know what nice. that is exactly. Yes. What are the most important top five KPIs for a consumer e-commerce company? KPI for those of you who don't know is key performance indicator. I had to look that up since I knew I knew what it was, but I didn't know yeah, what the acronym, the acronym yeah. actually stood for. So, um, what's, KPIs what's, for e-commerce consumer e-commerce. So here's so I'm gonna uh, you know 
I said, I feel a speech coming. Yeah, I was, it was, I was, gonna, <laughs> I was just going to totally pimp my company, Zulily. You know, we you were, we, we, uh, my partner, Eric Carlborg joined the firm and the day he joined the firm, he said, oh, I have a buddy who is working on this great business. We should hear the pitch. We said, great. And that business was Zulily. And so he came nice. in and pitched Zulily and we funded this business, which, uh, for those of you who don't know, is this e-commerce business where, for kids, clothing, yep. kids, things, etc. And it's now a public company. And that's probably all I can say because now it's a public company, but it's a great great business. Um, every every e-commerce business really has a different set of metrics, right? But in the end, you know, in, e in e-commerce, there's a very simple question, which is, what does it cost you to acquire a customer? What is the margin that you receive on the thing that that customer is purchasing? What's the lifetime value of that customer? So, you know, do you come and you buy something once? Or do you come and, re and buy repeatedly? And if you buy repeatedly, how often, how frequently? Because one of the challenges that people don't think about when they're building these businesses is, okay, great, the lifetime value of a customer is $100 and it only costs me 45 to acquire them. That's yeah. great, great yeah. margin. But if that $100 is over two years, you need a lot of money up front to keep that business going. Yep. Whereas if it turns out that it's $100 in the first quarter and you can acquire them, then okay, great. Your 45 bucks is paid back in 27 days, and then you're in the money, right? Yeah. And start, you start using that money to, to buy new customers. So, so what's it cost to get customers? How much margin have you got on those customers? And then what's their lifetime value? How much margin can you expect over time? And those things practically will be sufficient to determine, do you have a good business here? And the last thing I'd say is, for everything I look at, like how big is the market? So it may, that may, those metrics may all feel great, but it may be that you're selling, you know, uh, um, stone hammers or whatever. It's like, how many people need, you know, I'm sure you can acquire 17 guys to buy right. those to, right. uh, cost effectively, but the 18th, you're done. You know? Yep. All right. Makes sense. So Agent Red, I hope, uh, I hope go, that was Agent helpful. Um, let's, uh, let's move on while they're working on the, the calls. We got another tweet from Paul. What ideas is David, I think, what idea is David waiting for someone to walk in his door with? What have you been waiting for? Really good ones. No, I'll tell you, the one I always say I'm waiting for is wireless power. Wireless power. So, you know, uh, now... 15 years ago, two incredibly smart professors walked into our office and they said, you know what? We think that the state of RF technology is sufficiently far along that we can move data through the air. Yeah. And if we could move data through the air, there are all sorts of things you could empower. And we said, well, what makes you think that you can move data through the air and blah, blah, blah. I had this conversation. We ultimately funded these professors. And that company is a company called Atheros. Sure. And it turned out that, it, that Atheros then built the chips that power Wi-Fi in basically everything you have. Yep. And as I say, like there's no more important technology than the one that allows you to take your laptop into the bathroom. Like that changed, <laughs> the, changed the planet, right? Yes. Uh, now what I want, what I desperately want is that when you get your TV, your you know brand new flat screen TV, that the way you hang it is like a picture frame, right? You put up two things and you put it on the wall no and way. it has Wi-Fi and it has wireless power and you're done, yeah. right? And that is true of all sorts of things. And so, right, you know, right now, the big question is, oh, wireless power, but can you get in the way of it and not burn yourself, right? Yeah. Can you, can, are you allowed to have a pet in the house, you know? <laughs> um, but someone will come up with wireless power that is truly transformative and I'm super excited for that. So wireless power, bring me wireless power. All right. He's, uh, Paul's going to work on that, I'm sure. All right. All Thanks, right. Um, we have a, an email. This one's from Doug, and it says, what is the biggest investment mistake you've ever made, either putting <laughs> money in or missing an opportunity? So maybe you don't want to talk about a current company that <laughs> yeah, is, right, isn't yeah, going right, so yeah. well. Um, but maybe I'll, I do. Maybe, maybe you I, do. Maybe I, I want to vent. I don't want to. Maybe maybe you should vent. There's nobody mm. watching right now. It's just yeah, between just the two, the two of, us. of us. I'm just yes. going to say, I can't believe yes. I funded. No. Um, you know, the good news, bad news about the venture business is if you're doing it well, you will have said no to a bunch of really great companies. And that seems counterintuitive, but it's completely true, right? The vast majority of venture investors never have the opportunity to see companies that become big, exciting companies. Yeah. 
If you are lucky enough to be in the flow of that information and meet with great companies that could be transformative and you say no to them and then they turn out to be transformative, it is horrible, but you think, well, I could have said yes. Like maybe I'll, <laughs> maybe I'll say yes to the next one, right? So you know, uh, there is a string of companies that start, you know. All right, my, you got to name one though. You yeah, got okay, Twitter, fine. Yeah, Facebook. Twitter, yeah, I said no to, we said okay. no to Twitter okay. once. We gave them a term sheet the second time and got outbid. Said no to LinkedIn, said no to Zynga, said no to uh, Palantir, said no to, I wow. mean, I've the, 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 the take, the trail of tears is long and deep. In fact, I was at this event once with my wife. My wife doesn't go to any of these things with me, but this was like some awardy thing, and it was like the top 100 companies, and, and I was just sitting with her at the event, and they start announcing the, the companies or whatever, and I would lean over to her and go, uh, yeah, passed on that one. Uh, oh, passed on that one. <laughs> that, I'm about halfway through the list. She's like, you are killing me. Yeah. Like, what are you, <laughs> you suck you as a venture suck. capitalist. And the only, truly, the only thing that was saving me at that event is that I was being honored as VC of the year. So uh, I was like, I can't be like, it couldn't be that bad. You know, at least I said yes to Splunk, but it really, it was terrible. It was like, oh yeah, I said no to them. Oh, I said man. no to them. I said no to them. Well, you know, it, it happens to the best of us, right? So, um, <laughs> but the next one, bring it, bring it on, because the next yeah, one, I'm wireless totally power. He's yes. not going to say no to wireless power if you or bring it Or whatever. Like, there's got to be, there's going to be something amazing, right? Every day. I funded this company, Fastly. This is like, you know, now brought to you, David Hornick, brought to you by Fastly. I, I, I funded this company. I would never have been looking for a content distribution network that would compete with Akamai, right? Here's this company that's been around for 20 years. It's incredibly well established, but you know what? Team I'd worked with before, loved the team, and they have built a CDN business that is just better. When, when content providers sit down and look at it and try it out, it's faster, it's more flexible, it, you know, it, it caches more, but all these things that are amazing. And I said, great, done, I'm in. And I now have invested many millions of dollars in a CDN business, and I think it's gonna be a huge business. But, so maybe it's the next Fastly, right? What's the next thing? So you never know. All right, sounds good. Um... So uh, once again, if you want to reach us, you can call us one eight four 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 founder. Hopefully, we'll have the phone lines working so David's mom can call exactly. us. Exactly, Betsy Warnick, uh, get on it. Email help at founderline.com or tweet to at founderline, and we'll uh, see if we can answer your questions. So um, let's see uh, another email from Jack. I'm an experienced founder looking at moving to the VC side. Any advice for how to go about that process? Big question. You, yeah, right. You've been through. Run uh, away. Run, run away. Run away. Run, run away. That's what that's what all VCs say. <laughs> they say you don't want to be a VC. <laughs> that's just because we're trying to keep it small. It's like it's like uh, people from from uh, Washington who say you know yeah it rains up here all the time. Every time I go up there, it's beautiful. <laughs> I, so, yeah, you people are lying. It's awesome. Well, so what if what if Jack wants to uh, move to the VC side? What would you what would you tell him other than run away? Yeah, I wouldn't. Truthfully, the, uh, honestly, I think the venture business is incredible. Like my job is to spend time with the smartest people on the planet and hear a bunch of ideas that people are sufficiently excited about that they're willing to give up completely rational, stable jobs to do these things that will likely fail and cost them money, right? Yeah. I mean, that's passion. So I think it's an amazing job. The problem is it's there are very few VCs. There are fewer VCs who end up making money. It turns out it's just very, very hard. But putting that aside, what? how do you get in? So the venture business is a strange business, right? To a certain degree, it's about technology and being a thought leader and having, you know, being being someone who understands and, and, and can influence sectors of technology. And so yeah. there are people who have gotten into the venture world by being experts and 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 so one way is go be an expert and, and establish yourself as an expert. And if that sector seems exciting and interesting, there will be venture investors who will be happy to have you. Uh, some of it is really about just relationship building and knowing a lot of people, right? It is very, very hard to be a venture capitalist if you don't, don't know a ton of people. Yeah. If you don't have a big network of people N not in some kind of cynical way, but just like a set of relationships, right? In the end, when I joined August Capital, they knew that I had worked with a bunch of companies like Wen.com and Evite and Yahoo and others, and I had a group of people who I could draw upon when I was looking at something. So I could say, hey, Joe, what do you think? I'm looking at this business. What do you think of StubHub or yeah. whatever? And you'd say, oh, yeah, I'm happy to take a look, right? So, so 
One of the challenges I think for entrepreneurs is they don't, depending on where you're coming from, right? You may be an incredibly smart engineer, but you may not have realized that a big part of the business is about relationships. So, so I think that's interesting. Um, and the reality is it's very much a happenstance kind of thing, right? Like, oh, who knew? But we're looking, why don't you join us? So my partner yeah. Vivek, the way he ended up at our firm is he started this company, Cobalt. He had been at Apple. He was the technical leader of this, the first programmable server appliance. We were the biggest investors in the company. Partners at August got to know him very well. He sold his company for a couple billion dollars to Sun and he ran it in Sun and eventually he was like, ugh, I'm sick of being at Sun. And we said, great, why don't you come hang out with us and think of what you want to do next and we'll give and we'll fund it. He said, oh, that sounds great. He got in an office. And as he sat in, in August, he sort of said, I kind of like the investing thing. And he started looking at deals. And next thing you know, he's a GP in our next fund, right? Wow. So relationships, you need to know VCs because if you don't, and by the way, here's, here, here's a little tip. August Capital is looking for some young people to join the firm. So if you're watching this and you really want to be involved in the venture business, you know what? I'm, I'm looking for someone. I'm looking for some people who are, you know, know a bunch of people, are excited about technology, you know, have relationships across a, bu a bunch of interesting things. Ideally are very technical, but not necessarily. So, like you know. Like associate level or? Yeah, we're kind of, you know, we'll have some junior, like very junior, go look at bunches of things and be helpful. And someone who's kind of a little more senior than that, who's been in industry for a while and who might end up being a general partner, right? Who will you know, we would be thrilled if we could find someone. I have a, a, a young partner named Trip Jones who came in in that kind of, he'd seen a bunch of stuff, but, but he was pretty early to the business and he's just been spectacularly good at being involved in the business and, uh, and meeting great people and funding great companies. And so, you know, we're looking for that, the next Trip Jones. All right, there you go. So Hornick at augustcap.com. <laughs> there you go. All right, um, I, uh, I think the phones are gonna try working again? again. And uh, I believe we have Betsy Hornick on the oh, line. Oh, do we really? Oh, my Betsy, God. are you there? Yes. I am. Oh, oh is, is that mom? That is my mother. Hi, yes. mom. How are you? <laughs> uh, hi, Dave. You know, I always try to, to uh, answer the That's true. You, yeah, you, but my mom, my mom went on Second Life and created a Second Life avatar so wow. that she could say, "I have a Second wow. Life avatar." And uh, and and Mrs. Hornick, do you do you tweet as well? Are you a tweeter? <laughs> uh, you know, I'm not. I'm not a tweeter. Oh well. But you do follow me. I, is that upsetting? You, no, not really. I suppose he could teach me, but I, I think probably this is quite enough. And so maybe I'll just uh, say, bye, Dave. What? And That's it? You didn't even have like some compelling question? Don't, do, well, we, do, do you have any good, uh, do you have any good dirt on David when he was uh, younger? <laughs> oh, all right. Well, thank you for, uh, thank you for calling in. <laughs> all right. Oh, that's awesome! Well, well, th so she goodness. was watching. Oh, I told you. I'm See, telling you. We had we had at least one person watching the show this week. So you can I'm bank glad. on it. Now, I, when my partner Howard and I do our podcast, VentureCast, we always have shout outs to my mom because we know she'll listen. I don't know if anyone else listens to VentureCast, but at a minimum, Howard and I and my mom loves Howard. I actually think she she's like, oh, I love that Howard. Like, what am I doing? <laughs> I like, oh. But it's, I'm Howard. glad. I'm glad he's that dreamy. Yeah. he's dreamy. He's <laughs> dreamy. Yeah, exactly. Um, you're, you're MIT classmate Howard. That's right. <laughs> and and uh, and Hong, I don't I don't know if you're still out there watching Hong, but the phones are fixed. So it worked. Uh, give Come us, back. Give us a call back, and uh, I, I think I think this is Hong Kwan. I don't know if you know him, but uh, cool. Uh, yeah. Hopefully he hopefully he calls us back, and we'll we'll get him on the line. But meanwhile. We'll, uh, we'll move on. Let's see. Um, okay, we answered Jack's question. So now we have Michael. Um, in California, if I work on my own company at night, do I have to give those, do I have to, give those to the company I work at all day? I think the IP. IP, IP. Uh, what about the projects I've been working on since uh, before I joined the company? All right, well, wow. This so is, it's you know, a, lawyer this is a lawyer question. There you now, go. We need Mitch Where's Zookley. Mitch? Mitch. We need 
oh my goodness, it's ask a lawyer time and yes. I am no longer qualified. That's right. No. This is not legal advice. So, so you know, it's funny. Uh, right. I had this moment in time. I, I came home. I'd been a venture investor for five years or something. I come home and I'm talking to my wife and I said, oh, I have this realization today. She said, oh, yeah, what's the realization? I said, I realized that it's, you know, I've been a VC for a while. It's not clear whether I'm good at that. But what is clear is that I'm no longer qualified to be a lawyer. <laughs> you know, and she was sort of like, you know, shouldn't you have thought about this? This is, your, you know, you should have thought about this. Anyway, this is a lawyer question. So let me start out with my disclaimer. A, I am a, no longer a, a practicing attorney. I am a, I'm an inactive member of the California Bar. And he, he and, was never a very good lawyer to begin with. <laughs> that's so, that's you know, right. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah, now, now the word, now I can, I can. Uh, the truth that. comes yes, out. Yes, yes absolutely. Really, I, I didn't sleep so many nights for you, and this is the repayment. <laughs> um, so here's, so here's the general answer, right? Which is not legal advice. You, sh if you are very serious and you're focused on this and you're building a business, you should contact a lawyer. And I actually, I, I mean this in general. It is a it is in your interest to to contact a lawyer. I have funded an awesome company. It's like, you know, also brought to you by Rocket Lawyer. I funded a, a former colleague of mine uh, from Venture Law Group who started this company, Rocket Lawyer. Oh yeah. And Rock the Charlie. Thing, Char Charlie Moore. And yep. the reason that Rocket Lawyer is great is that it understands that lawyers actually are valuable, right? It gives small businesses, entrepreneurs, opportunities to get incorporated, to have real questions. You, you, you subscribe to Rocket Lawyer and you have access to attorneys who can answer exactly this kind of question. So the short answer is go to Rocket Lawyer. But the longer answer is um, stuff you did before should not be included in your company. In almost all companies in Silicon Valley, when you join, you sign a, an, an agreement, a, a, an assignment of IP agreement. And in it, it says, please list the things you're bringing to the company. And there's a sheet where you can say, I did these things before. They're not yours. PIIA, I believe. Yes, yes. whatever that is. Yes. Proprietary I, inventions, Yo, something, look something. Yeah, look at you. Look at you. I haven't been a lawyer for a lot of yeah, time. Yeah, you don't have to deal so, with those So, yeah, anymore. right. Secondly, no, your company does not own all of your time. There is not, it isn't like everything, you're 24-7 for your company. But what I would say is this. If you are, do not work on your work computer. Do not work on your work network. Don't use your work's Hadoop cluster to calculate things for your business. Truly do it on your own. Make it an independent. Go buy thing. another machine, right? Get another laptop. I know, I know Get it's a pain. Get another network. Yeah. Work on, you, yeah. know, uh, you know, on the Amazon network. Yeah, it's, it is. And you need to be very careful, right? There will be a great temptation in the middle of the day to be emailing about your business. Well, I can tell you there have been lawsuits where the first thing they say is show me all your email. And it's like, well, guess what? You were emailing about this at two in the afternoon in between your meeting with so-and-so or whatever. And the last thing I'd say is if it is related to the business you're doing now in oh, your job, yeah it's all the more perilous. So if you're at some big enterprise business and you're working on a consumer messaging platform, whatever, it will be harder to make that connection. But if you are working in a bank on, uh, on pricing and then you're building a bank pricing engine, yeah. really, really challenging and, yeah. and you need to be very <laughs> careful. Uh, good, good advice. Um, all right, next question. We have a tweet that came in from Lisa Mitchell. The tweet is, what percentage of deals come in your door with a woman as CEO? Hmm. Well, uh, come in my door is an interesting question. Like, what percent uh, are, are, you know, are introduced to us by with women CEOs? I, I guess the answer is it's actually a very small percentage. Like below 10%, um, would you say? Probably so. Okay. Probably so. Wow. I'd say, and... Um, and I'd say that the number of companies that we have funded with with uh, women as CEOs is it may be better than that percentage to tell you the truth, but mm. it's still a very low percentage, right? We have a number of great CEOs. We funded uh, a company called Ditto with a wonderful woman as a CEO. A company called Beckon with a fantastic uh, female CEO. I funded a company called Ohi in the day with a fantastic female CEO. It's not that we are not funding these companies, um, but but we are really dependent upon, particularly in our model, we're very dependent upon uh, hearing about businesses that are being founded by women, you know, people of color, et cetera. We, we'd be excited to fund companies that are founded by people as, as amazing as a Tristan Walker. 
we just have to meet them, right? Yeah. And so, yeah. um, uh, but but that isn't to say that we can't do better. And we're you know as as you know, um, you know we're sort of always working hard to try and encourage people to build great businesses. So yeah. All right, sounds good. So um, uh, I'd like to take a minute now to thank our sponsors. So uh, this show would not be possible without the support we receive from our amazing sponsors, Ustream and Oric. So first, um, let's start off with Ustream. Uh, we've been working with Brad, the CEO, and the rest of the team there for the last couple of months. And uh, as, as some of you know, we took the show on the road recently over to Europe and did a show in London and a show in Paris. And throughout all of that, we were able to broadcast uh, either here from the studio or overseas with, with no issues whatsoever. So uh, love the product, love the team that supports it. And uh, we've, we've just had a great experience. It's how we're able to bring this to you uh, every week live uh, from, from here in Silicon Valley. So if you're thinking about uh, doing some meetings or you have some sort of event that you want to promote and live stream it out to the, uh, to the internet universe, uh, get in touch with, with Ustream. You can go to their web website, it's uh, ustream.tv, and I'm sure they'll, uh, they'll help you out the same way that uh, they've helped us out. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Mitch Zookley and the team over at Auric. Uh, I've known Mitch for many years, going back to his, uh, his VLG days with, yep. with David, and uh, great guy. Um, the team over there is, is awesome. And I always tell people that when, when you're starting a company, uh, you, you want to have a lawyer, obviously, to be able to handle the legal paperwork. But more importantly, you want them as one of your key trusted advisors, somebody who's seen so many transactions, whether they're financings or uh, M&A transactions, whatever it might be, way more than you'll ever see. And having a great lawyer to help you out with those things is, is critical. So um, uh, I, I've worked with the team over there numerous times, including now with Founderline. And uh, you know, be sure to get a great lawyer. You can go to auric.com and find out more about, uh, about Mitch and his team over there. So. Um, that's it for the sponsor shout, shout outs. Um, once again, if you want to reach us, the phones are working again. So you can call us 1 844 4 Founder. You can email help at founderline.com and you can tweet to at founderline and we'll see, uh, see if we can help you out. Yeah, you might be able to get through now that my mom's not clogging the phone line. Yeah, mom's. Uh, I, I was hoping she'd have a good, uh, good question. I thought um, that was very restrained of her. I thank you, mother. And and by the way, we got Lisa on Twitter responded. David, you are awesome. I knew that would be the answer. Percent of deal flow is low. So, uh, uh, but thank you, Lisa. Yeah. we're try we're working hard, and you know, um, uh, we'd be thrilled. So honestly, if you're a woman founder of a company uh, who's looking for funding. You know, Hornick at AugustCap.com. We're thrill, thrilled to hear about it. We'll, we'll keep throwing We'll put that in the next sponsor take is yeah. uh, Hornick at AugustCap.com. August Hornick at AugustCap.com. Okay. All right. So uh, <laughs> let's let's see. We've got, uh, let me see if we've got any calls. No calls right now. So let's, let's go through the emails. Um, this one's from Amy. Um, how much of your investment decision is product versus team versus market? So you spoke a little bit about this yeah. earlier, yeah. but... Um, yeah. uh, what do you think? I think the short answer is it, it, the venture business, the entrepreneurial business is a people business, right? At the end of the day, you want to work with amazing people. And the other thing about it is the, you know, the way you get funded, the process is a pretty, uh, is a pretty standard process. So, you know, someone emails you and says, hey, you know, so you, you say, hey, David, I know this great entrepreneur. You should hear her story. And I say, oh, awesome. This is someone that Joe knows. That's a great credibility. I'm excited to hear it. I email and say, let's get together for an hour and tell me about your business, right? Then she comes in and she tells me about the business. And usually it's by showing me some stupid PowerPoint, but the, re but the bigger point is she says, okay, this is why I'm excited about my business, et cetera. And hopefully at the end of that, you say, oh, I'm super excited about this business. I wanna learn more. That's the whole bit. Well, yep. guess what? Some of that is about product, right? You don't want people to be building things that don't make sense. Right. I'm looking for people to be solving real problems in a thoughtful way. A bigger chunk of that is about market. 
it has to be a big, huge problem, right? It turns out, I have never known a venture business that we funded and then it turned out it had a bigger market than we thought. I have only <laughs> funded companies where it's like, I thought it was billions and now it's millions. Stop doing you know? that. Would you yeah, stop? Yeah, right, don't do that. It's hard, right? So huge market matters, right? Solves a very big problem that is, uh, that is ubiquitous. But all of that is totally irrelevant if you are not incredibly excited about working with this particular founder and the team that she's built. Yep. And so I always say, like, at the end of the day, if, at the, if, if the, we have a great meeting and I go to bed that night and as I close my eyes, there's this period of time between when you close your eyes and you fall asleep and you think about something, right? Maybe you think about, oh, my kids, or what am I gonna do about this? Or, oh, that was an awesome episode of Game of Thrones. <laughs> but if you think, huh, I wonder if we could do blah, blah, blah about that business that you heard about, yeah. now you're on to something. Yep. And that is a people thing. That is not like, oh, I'm sighted, I'm thinking about that. It's, you have captured my imagination. I, I tell people, it's, they have to fall in love with you. Like, like literally, if, if you, you know, you might say, well, that's gonna be a huge business, but I just, I'm really not interested in that at all. You're never going to fund that, right? Yeah. So you've yeah. got to, A, want to work with those people, and B, think, hey, this business might go somewhere, right? And, yeah. uh, and so I, I always tell people, you know, don't, don't take it personally. Like, you know, I've pitched you on companies, and you've said no, yeah. and yeah. I still talk to you. Even, I appreciate you know, that. I, <laughs> you do give me crap every time. Like, I, all right. This is the last one. Yeah, I'm yeah, I'm you. never showing you one again. Um, <laughs> Except but, the next. One. But uh, but I, I think I, I think it I think it's true. Like you know when I when I look at angel deals, like if, if it's not interesting to me, it's just like I'm not going to waste my time on that. Yeah, I, I yeah. life's too short. So well, and the and the life's too short, right? I've been on the Splunk board for ten years. I've been on the Ebates board. I've been following Ebates now for fourteen years. Wow. Now. Turns out it's a great, I, I love the founders. I, I think it's a super interesting business and it's now quite a large business. Yeah. But even if I hated the founders and it was not a large business, I'd still have been on the board for 14 years, right? Yeah, that's a for, long I've time. been married to my wife in three weeks for 20 years and I've been going to Ebates board meetings for 14 of them. Wow. Right? That's a, you know. I'm That's not, a big commitment. I'm not going to ask you uh, which of those you know you prefer over the other. I might get him in big trouble. Although not he said she wasn't. I she love wasn't. Love Pamela, um, even if she's not ever ever going to see this. And and I just got a note from our producer. It says David's father wants David to know he's listening too. <laughs> oh, they're so two. They're two. I, I I I don't know. Are they on the same stream? Because that would only count as one. So yeah. Um, okay. De not actually. Ironically, they probably are not listening in the same stream. Okay. Because good. My mom is probably in the TV room and my dad is probably in, at his desk. Well, uh, Mr. Hornick, if you could do me a favor and, and like go to another room and open up another stream, Third okay? Browser. That that'll that'll we'll get at least an extra nickel out of that, I'm sure, right. some some day. So You thank think he's not doing that? My dad right now is going and opening another <laughs> stream. Open a bunch of windows and and uh, <laughs> different IP addresses, you know, whatever whatever you got in the house. So my you know, so my dad is a a technical guy. He was a, he was a, one of the early guys at Digital Equipment Corporation. Was there for many many years. He was a te you know the systems guy at the Media Lab. Like if you had told the, him this in advance, we could have gotten a good forty streams going. But oh, now you're, now he's scrambling. Man. The poor man is scrambling to figure out how many windows he can open, how he can proxy them. All, all that right. Stuff. I was I was just kiss, kidding, Mr. Hornick. So you don't right. have to do that. So but you can but just listen. Thank to this you. Thank you for listening and show. and uh, you know send us send us some good questions if if you want. Um, all right, we have another uh, we have another call uh, from Aaron in the three hundred three. Aaron, nice. you're on with David. Go ahead. Hi, David. Um, I have a question for you. So, uh, if you have a startup that is pre-product, um, you're about um, say month and a half to three months out, uh, but you need to raise money. Would you uh, bridge with your current investor, or would you go ahead and go after the Series A? It's hard to say. I mean, the, the reality is that every financing is different, right? There are some businesses that, that there's a joke in the venture business that there's nothing that kills a valuation more than having revenue, right? There have been lots and lots of businesses that have been pre-revenue. And so it's all about the hopes and dreams of the story. And so you end up getting a, a, a financing done at hundred million dollar valuation because nobody knows for certain that you're only going to make $2 or whatever. Um, and the same is a little bit true of product, of being pre-product, which is if you have a great team of people and they're working on an interesting and challenging uh, problem, 
Um, it may be that you could go today to an August Capitol and say, hey, here's what we're working on. Here's how, where we are and we're excited. And with you know $5 million, we can in 18 months do X, Y, and Z. And I'd say, great, that's exciting. But it may be the case that the thing that there will be enough unanswered questions that will say, great, when this product is working and we can see how consumers interact with it, come back and tell me about it and I can, and I can get more data. So um, there isn't a clear cut answer. What I would say is as a general matter, uh, I think that angel money is very well suited for demonstrating, uh, you know, getting, getting a, a product working, showing that there is interest. It's not about scaling your business. It's not about marketing. It's not about, you know, those sorts of things, but it is about getting going. And so if you don't feel like you've gotten to a sort of natural uh, jumping off point on your business, I'd bridge with the existing folks to get to that point so that you can say, here was the expectation with this early money and look what we built. All right, cool. Hope that helps, Aaron. Um, let's see, here's, a, here's an email from David, uh, for David, and uh, it says, what's the best way to discuss my new startup with you at a first meeting? Just share the story or a deck of 10 slides? These all have question marks. Um, so, you know, what, what, what do you like in that, that first meeting? You know, some great person has been referred to you. They show up. Do you want them plugging into the projector? You want them you handing know, out? Just it really depends on the people, right? Okay. I, I, I had a meeting once. My, my partner Howard and I sat down with a, an entrepreneur named Wences Caceres. I don't yeah. know if you know Wences. Yeah. But Wences was, can tell us about his business. And he got to like the first slide, and then we started talking about Wences' life. Started to under, you know, hearing about the previous businesses he's had built and all this stuff. And that's basically what we talked about over the course of the hour. And when we left, the only thing we wanted to do was marry Wences. <laughs> like Wences <laughs> is right. unbel he's amazing. And it was perfectly clear to me that Wences was gonna build an amazing business, right? That that he his history and his background had led to a point in time where he was building a business that made a huge amount of, uh, uh, of sense and that was exciting. And so for that meeting, he, it was perfect, it was great, and it was not about a set of slides, okay. right? But on the other hand, there are plenty of instances where you, know, you need some structure to help you get through it. It's a, it is actually a very tricky thing to spend an hour telling the story about your business without some structure to it, without, yeah. if you can do it, you're pretty amazing, yeah. but it's very hard. So I think as a general matter, don't shy away from PowerPoint. PowerPoint is a great tool. Just understand that when an, when an investor says, well, tell me about X, Y, and Z, if it's not your next slide, tell them about X, Y, and Z, right? Yeah. Don't, be, don't be a slave to your to your process yeah. and your slides. I'll get to that in slide 83. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if that's okay. Yeah, yeah. And you gotta go, all right, uh, you know, I'll wait. No, no, if, if they say, if they ask you a question, like you wanna answer that right away because that that's what's on their mind as the current stumbling block. And if you don't get over that stumbling block, I'm, I'm translating, uh, then, then you're probably not gonna get anything done. So, um, or address it a little bit and say, I got a whole slide on that in three slides. We'll, you know, we'll cover it well, more in a second. Well, it's also an opportunity, I have to say. I was, I, 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 like all things in venture, nothing is, uh, nothing's 100%. Because I was once on a panel and I was talking about this. And I said, if you are pitching me and you get through your whole presentation and I have not asked you a question, understand that you, I will not fund you. Like that's <laughs> not, you, you know, that is not going to happen, right? <laughs> because I'm... If I'm engaged and excited and interested, I will say, well, what about this or what about that or whatever? So if you've marched your way through the presentation, you haven't gotten a question, it's a bad sign with me. Yep. And one of the guys on the panel said, huh, well, I would never interrupt you. I want you to be able to tell your story. And then when we get to the end, then I'll ask you questions. Whatever. Uh. And I thought, well, that's weird. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but that was his process, yeah, right? Yeah. So for me... The questions are where you find out everything, right? It's yeah. where you find out whether someone is engaged and smart and knows a lot and has opinions and all that stuff. Well, and you throw them off a little bit and see how they react to, you know, being disturbed in the middle of their... Yeah, uh, I mean, I, maybe that stuff... I mean, certainly that happens, right? Yeah. Like, but it's... Uh, That's I not your primary not objective. Yeah, it's not really a tactic as much as it's just... I'm, in, I'm curious. Yeah. Like, oh, tell me about this, yeah, right? Like, I'm excited. Tell me, how, tell, how are you going to get 
customers? How are you, how, is yeah. this a massive business, right? Yeah. And it's an opportunity. It's like, oh my God, are you kidding me? This is like the biggest business, are you, this is the biggest business you've ever seen. Like, okay, tell me about that. All right, good. Um, well, hopefully, uh, hopefully, David, that helps out. Um, here's another one from Adi, I think it's pronounced, A-D-I. If I'd like to join a startup, how important is it to network, attend conferences, et cetera? <laughs> so I think join as, a, as an employee, it sounds like. Yeah. Well, it depends on what you do. <laughs> Right. Um, it's interesting. I mean, if you are an if you're an engineer right now and you, you know, have a set of skills and you can help, you know, if you want to get a job, go build skills around being a mobile engineer, figure out how to build Android apps or, or iOS apps and you will find a job. Right. Yeah. So it really depends on what you're doing. Um, the question you should ask yourself if you want to join a startup is how am I going to find the startup I want to join? There are lots of startups and they're all recruiting and you know there's a, there, there are way more jobs right now in Silicon Valley than there are people looking for them. So that's not the problem. Now maybe you're somewhere else and then I guess the answer is come to Silicon Valley. <laughs> but what you really want to figure out is how do I find the job I want? How do I find that startup I'm excited about? And then for sure it's about networking. And networking is not this like, oh, you know, pleased to meet you and, you know, tell me what you're doing and how I can help you. It's, you know, it's meeting your friends' friends and understanding what they're working on and saying, oh my God, Uber, like the early days of Uber, holy cow, that's super exciting. How can I help you, right? Yep. Um, so, Conferences, I don't know if it's a conference or it's a party, right? We have this big part, tech crunchy party thing at our, on our patio and hundreds of people show up and they meet lots and lots of other people working on all sorts of other things. That's a great opportunity to meet people. Maybe more interesting than a, than a conference, but maybe the best thing to do is take a class in, you know, in, uh, in UI inter in interface design or whatever, right? Who knows? All right, hope that helps, Adi. Um, here's one from Mike. If you meet a company and the team is an issue, do you tell them that or find another way to let them down gently? So this is appropriate in our case, of course, because you know, you've never wanted to say, you know, Joe, you're yeah, exactly. really the problem. Exactly. So, exactly. so how, do, how, do you, how do you handle that? What, what, do you, uh, what do you do? And maybe, maybe sometimes it's multiple factors, like yeah. I don't really care about this and the market's not big and you kind of suck. So. How, how do so you handle it? Honestly, this is a totally fair and interesting and impossible question, right? Because for some reasonable number of companies, you're not, it's, there isn't a connection or you don't think the person who's pitching you on that business is the right person or whatever. Yeah. But no matter how you couch that, it will feel like an ad hominem attack. It yeah. will feel like, you know, and you, I suppose not, you could say, this business feels to me like it's a very technical business and, and it doesn't strike me that you're a sufficiently technical leader. Even then, I think people will be like, oh, I can't believe it. Damn right? you, Hornick. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, so what do you do? Do, do, you, do you give it to them straight or do you kind of couch it in, you know? Yeah, I mean, most of the time, as you say, there are multiple, multiple challenges with the business. And I think that you know, I'm increasingly of the mind that I'm going to give you very clear feedback about why I think it's challenging. I used to shy away from it because I found that there are two types of entrepreneurs. There are entrepreneurs who take that feedback and they are very thankful, right? They say, oh, wow, that's great. And I appreciate someone being straightforward, et cetera. And my partner, Howard, is incredibly blunt. And for those people, Howard is amazing because he says, this is too small and this is a problem and why don't you do that? And by the way, you're not the right founder for this, but you know, he'll lay, lay it out there. And for those entrepreneurs, they're like, oh my God, Howard, thank you so much. And we changed this, blah, blah, blah. And they call him back, like, what about this? And they end up having these kind of interesting back and forth with Howard. Then they're the other half. And the other half <laughs> are like, you know, what, you're an idiot. Like, I can't believe you're such an idiot because that's not the problem, whatever. Or the other version, which is, no, 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 that's not right. I did this. Yeah. I did, you know, they, it's argument. And, yeah. and I can tell you this with great certainty. There's not a, there's no instance probably in the history of venture capital where that argument resulted in you getting financed, yes. right? Yes. Now, if I want to engage in a conversation and say, well, I'm concerned that it isn't a big enough market. What do you think of that? Great. Then we'll have a back and forth and, and maybe you convince me. But if I say, I've determined this is not a big enough market, and then you say, no, you're mistaken because yeah. of X, Y, and Z. 
Yeah. It's not going to happen. Yeah. I, I remember, I can't remember who I was pitching, but I remember like I was 15 minutes in and I just knew there's no way this is going anywhere. This was not with you, by the way. And, uh, and I'm like, I'm thinking in my mind as I'm talking, I'm like, do I just get up just and leave it. right now? Just call, just call it. Just call Like, let's not waste his time. Let's not waste my time. And so I, I kind of like accelerated the pace mm-hmm. and sped through the rest of the slides because I didn't want to insult whoever it was. But it was just like, why did, why did you even take this meeting? Like, it's clear <laughs> you had no interest in this from the get-go. It, it was almost See, that's like... that's too bad. I think because there is a tricky thing, right? I do think there is a norm... And, and if you breach it, it's so, as you say, it, the best thing for both of you would have been for you to say, it strikes me this isn't a deal that is of interest to you. And so thanks for your time. And everybody gets up and goes on. Yeah. But the chance of you pissing him off yeah. are yeah. sufficiently high that it's not worth it. In the same way that there are many instances where a half hour in, I've determined it's not the appropriate deal for me. But there is no, there, you know, there's just no circumstance in which I can say, yeah, you know, I don't want to. TikTok. I, I'm busy, man. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm I'm sure you got some good stuff in the next half hour, but I'm gonna pass. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's not gonna happen. Yeah. No, that's tough. Um, those are those are definitely tough situations. So, um, Mike, hope hope that helps you out. Hope uh, you know, VCs are gonna say no to you, so get used to it. Like you gotta you gotta have thick skin, and you gotta find the right one for you. And and if. Uh, you know, someone doesn't like your business, you probably don't want to be spending time and with them And it's okay anyway. to tell you truthfully, you know, PayCycle, this, this payroll business that yeah. I funded, they had met with dozens of VCs who said no before I said yes. And so, you know, it's painful, like you're, you've had enough of that. But on the other hand, Renee and I had a great relationship. We built a big business together. You know, it worked out fine. Yeah. It's, it's hard work, VC, you know, being an entrepreneur is brutal. I think it is a really hard job. You know, because you've lived it in multiple instances. Yeah, can't you it's, see? Yeah, look at how tired <laughs> I am. It's a hard job. No, I'm resting now, uh, so I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> yeah, we're seated. I'm getting more sleep than you right now, so that's good. Not fair. Uh, well, you know, you, you get to take, uh, what, the month of August off? Is that is Theoretically, that I've blown it this year. Yeah. I'm, take, I'm taking, like, no vacation this summer. Man, it's what is wrong with you? You're, I, that's like a VC entitlement thing. I know. You're, I'm going to be kicked out of the union. Yeah, I know. You better, you better watch that. That's they're going to they're gonna be counting. Um, all right. So I think we got time for at least one more, maybe two more. Um, so uh, Brent emails and says, how much time do you spend working with your existing companies versus looking at new companies? Yeah, it changes. Uh, it has changed over time, right? Uh, when I joined August, I had no portfolio companies. I wasn't on any boards. I quickly started, you know, working with Ebates. I, you know, f- funded Paycycle, et cetera. But that, that, you know, those things shift, right? So now I have, I, I have a number of portfolio companies. I have a bunch of companies that I'm, I'm helping out. And the other thing is that we have, we have learned at August that because each of us has different networks and different sets of relationships, it's very much in our interest to help each other with those relationships, with thinking about businesses, finding great executives. So not only are you working on your own companies, but you're also saying, oh, how can I help you connect, you know, Tejile with with X company or whatever. So, yeah, yeah. Um, so I found that increasingly I am spending time with the companies. But what I would say is this. There, there is a specific set of time that I spend, and those are the board meetings. We have board meetings that range from somewhere between monthly to quarterly and all the boards that I'm on. And it's a half a day that, you know, in some instances, it, it's a day or we have an offset. Or, but it's, you know, you can imagine a half a day. I'm going to do that monthly. I'm going to spend a half a day with the business, get to know it, feel, yep. be helpful, etc. The rest of the time is up to that entrepreneur to say, hey, David, can you... You know, right before I came here, I was meeting an engineering cl- uh, candidate for one of my portfolio companies to convince him that he should join a great company, right? Thrilled to do it. The CEO emailed me, said, can you do this? And the next day I met with this with this uh, engineer. That's what I should be doing. Yeah. It turns out that that, you know, that can fill a great deal of time, but that's a good use of my time. And if it helps my companies be successful, then great. And so, so what percentage of your time would you say? Uh, yeah, I guess I didn't answer yeah, the question. You avoided I, the question, yeah, sir. Yeah, exactly. At, more than half of my time, I'd say, at this point, is spent on helping portfolio companies be successful. Got it. Uh, when I started, it was a smaller percentage, and you know, now it exceeds fifty percent. All right, good. 
Well, um, I'm afraid we are out of time. What? Yes, can you believe it? Oh my God, Joe, you'll have to have me back. uh, Yeah, maybe. (laughs) (laughs) Only if your parents send me, you know, nice uh, holiday gifts or something. I I don't know, we'll see. see. Don't say those things, because now they have to send you a holiday gift. No, no, I'm just kidding, just kidding. David (laughs) can come back anytime he wants. I'll get you Joe's email, uh, mailing address. Anytime he wants. So, um... Thank you for being such a great guest. We got a lot of questions answered. Um, if you want to follow David on Twitter, he's always building his Twitter audience. So yeah, you can exactly. go uh, check out his handle is at David Hornick. And if you can't figure out how to spell it, then uh, that's not my problem. <laughs> then, um, then you are not using Google. And email <laughs> Hornick at AugustCap.com. Hornick at AugustCap.com. Hornick at AugustCap.com. Uh, tune in next week for another episode of Founderline. Our guest will be Mark Goins. Speaking of financial Goins. startups, oh man, yeah, what a letdown, Mark. <laughs> oh man, I'm gonna make sure I, I love, tell him that. I love Mark. Uh, Goins. Mark uh, is a great angel investor and e- an even better troublemaker. So yeah. you definitely want to tune in for that. From the Intuit world, he's a Absolutely. great guy. Mark, Mark and I have become uh, very good friends, and uh, that's next Thursday, um, 5 p.m. Pacific time. Thank you once again to our fantastic sponsors, Ustream and Auric. Um, don't forget to follow us on Twitter as well. Our handle is at Founderline. You can send your questions for Mark now, uh, help at founderline.com. You can go to our website. It's, as you might have guessed, founderline.com. And you can subscribe to our email updates, um, watch the previous episodes, which we usually get up there within 24 hours. And then, uh, You can also subscribe to our podcast on iTunes. Thanks for watching. Here's to the crazy ones, and we'll see you again next week.